Howard is now the uh, co-founder and CEO of Rome. He is the former uh, co-founder and CEO of Yext, which uh, he took public here in uh, New York City. Um, and we're going to talk about hacks, tricks, tips of a repeat founder. Many of the things we're going to talk about today, I think, go against conventional wisdom uh, or what many people would say is common sense. So first, mentality-wise is where I want to start. You start the first one, you eat glass for a while, it works, you take it public, you get to like raise the trophy, ring the bell, you win. Why the fuck are you doing it again? <laughs> I'm obviously got a sickness. Uh, I started started Rome the the next day after I stepped back from Yex. I incorporated the company, so I think it really. Now it's interesting because when you think about the energy that you use as as your company grows, there's different phases of every company. So you know, kind of going from zero to one is very different than running a global public company at scale. So the actions you have to take change over that time. So while I may have depleted all of my sort of stamina around how to talk to public market hedge funds about EPS last quarter, I had a lot of energy reserves built up for a zero to one type of uh, innovation period. So it was not that hard to kind of just shift given that I had a lot left to do this. But yeah, I'm fucking crazy. <laughs> um, some of the things we're gonna talk about today are not just theories you have, you're actively doing it as you build yeah. Rome. Um, and so one of the things that you did, which I think surprised people very quickly, uh, is you named one of our mutual friends, Brent Saunders, as the chairman of the board. Yep. You are a startup. Having a board sometimes is even unique for a startup, but the founder not being the chairman of the board, I think is very rare. Why did you do that? So this is one of my first hacks and I'm actually kind of shocked that more people don't do this. When you are starting a company, you have maximum leverage to do whatever you want and particularly construct your board. And board construction isn't really something that you think about until later on. But what you want to be doing as much as possible when you start your company is stacking the board of directors. We're talking about the board of directors here. Uh, I assume everybody knows what the board of directors is. You want to stack that in your favor as much as possible early on because the decisions that you make on day one like stay with you forever. It's kind of like if you write something in your corporate charter, even when you go to raise an A and a B and a C in further rounds, it tends to not change. These, these things tend to stick. And so for example, if you have two co-founders and you put all three of you on the board, like when you go to raise an A round or a B round, usually somebody's not gonna say, oh, you have to kick someone off the board. So all of a sudden, if you're thinking about should I put two people on my board or three people, now you have three board seats instead of two. So you basically stacked the board deck in your favor out of the get-go. Now, there's a, you can sort of take this to the next level and every board has a chairman and the chairman is simply it can be interpreted however you want operationally, but the chairman is actually really just a ceremonial title. They don't really do anything. Uh, they literally have one function, which is to call the meeting to order. So it's like kind of like you guys up here just calling the, the conference to order for the day. They stand up here, they do it, and then like the, the chairman can do whatever they want, the chair. So as you're, the earlier you are, the more likely you are gonna be able to sort of set this up in your favor. And so I named, like you said, Brent Saunders, the chairman of Rome. And why would I do that? I mean, look, I've run a public company, I've done billion dollar IPOs, I've raised half a billion dollars of capital. Why do I need somebody to kind of like go along this? And the fact is that it doesn't matter where you are, there's always someone that has done more shit than you. And Brent is the perfect example of that because Brent ran and was, was the CEO and chairman of Allergan Health, which is an 84 billion, $83 billion pharmaceutical company. And so, you know, you can kind of keep leveling up and you, you're really just a function of the people around you as much as possible. So I just wanted to, you know, since, since my objective this time around with Rome is to go to that level of scale, I wanted someone that had kind of charted those paths before. But the coolest thing is, 
if you put, if you have a VC, now let's say you're not incubated, but like you have a Series A investor and they're a venture capitalist and you go to that VC and say, look, you know, I think we should, I'd like to find someone better and smarter than me to be the chairman of the company. And by the way, this person is the founder or the CEO of a 50 billion or $10 billion Fortune 50 company. People, the, the VC will say yes to that. Like it's a, it's, a, it's a really good signal for your company if you can get somebody that's been on public boards and has been the, the CEO of something to join your board. It, it's a huge signal of strength to investors. It's a huge signal of strength to customers that somebody of that caliber is willing to, to take it on. And frankly, a lot of these people that have done these kinds of things before are like open-minded to being like the chairman of a startup. They think it's cool. Like I've seen this happen before. Um, so, you know, Sprinkler, for example, has, has a chairman that was like a very high level executive at Cisco. So I just, I think it's a really good uh, technique to first off, stack the board in your favor. Second, give someone, get someone in there in the room that uh, really can just do a totally different thing than you're able to do since you're trying to go from zero to one and they may have done something way bigger. Uh, and, then, and then third, really set yourself up for the long run in having a board construction that's going to be to your favor. You do five minute meetings. Teddy Roosevelt did five minute meetings. And Howard Lerman. Two, let me say it like this. <laughs> uh, Why do you do the five minute meetings? By the way, I like sometimes just wish I like could ride in here like on a horse, <laughs> like a rough rider. <laughs> Teddy Roosevelt used to do these five minute meetings. Have you read The Bully Pulpit? We talked about yes. this. Yeah, The Bully Pulpit by Dor you know, Doris Kearns Goodwin. She's one of my favorite authors. She's a presidential historian. Uh, you know, she's written the, the, the book about Lincoln and all that kind of stuff. But this, this particular book about, about Teddy, I was reading, and it turned out that Teddy Roosevelt, one of the most remarkable people you can imagine, did meetings in five minutes. Now, we all schedule 30 minute meetings and 60 minute meetings and 45 minute meetings to talk about shit that's way less important than the president used to decide in five minutes. So I'm like reading this and I'm like, my goodness, why do I need 45 minutes for a, you know, certain type of design review or whatever when the president of the United States would probably make, you know, have a five minute meeting and make decisions about this. And so I actually at Yext instituted five minute meetings. And I think you, you have to be intentional with how you use them, but the way that I started to do these five minute meetings was, for example, when we began to expand to Europe. And we had 100 people in, 120 people in London, 100 people, and I was able to meet with basically all of them in a day. All 100 people in one day. And what we would do is set up five minute meetings, and here's how it works. And the key pomp is you have to be really intentional and prescriptive and run it by the clock. So I would put a clock there. Uh, I'd have someone you know, knock on the door when 30 seconds was left so that you had a good feeling of the time. And then I would simply ask, what are you working on? And when you ask someone what they're working on, and then this is pretty important, I, <laughs> I can be a little intense. So I would not make eye contact with the person while they answered. I, I, I never take notes. Do you take notes, by the way? No. Yeah, I never take notes either, but I would pretend to take notes because it was a good sort of decoy into not making eye contact with them because I didn't want to scare the fucking shit out of them. So you, you begin to absorb, they begin to talk, and you'd be shocked how long five minutes is if you, once you begin to uh, really uh, get someone going, a Super Bowl ad is 30 seconds, so you get like 10 ads in a row, basically, in five minutes, and if you listen to them and hear them, you can absorb a ton. So I would do like, you know, 80 meetings in a day, it's 400 minutes, it actually went by pretty fast. I had a giant pile of notes when I was done that I discarded, but I, I left that with a very clear sense of everything going on. And the company would love it because I would get to meet everybody that was in the London office and they would get five minutes with the CEO to tell them what was on their mind. And I would simply ask, tell me what's on your mind. Tell me what, tell me what you're working on. And frankly, a lot of times people would get it out and then it would be over and then they'd end early. It just, you know, the more intelligent people are, the more they begin to do higher level chunking with concepts. You know exactly what I'm talking about because that's how the human brain works. It's like the fox and the, you know, it's like sour grapes. That term comes from 
you know, the story, the fable of the famished fox that was looking at them and couldn't get them and then decided, well, fuck, I didn't want those grapes anyway. I couldn't get them. So sour grapes is a term that we all understand. And so people that are working together closely and are highly intelligent and working towards a shared mission are able to begin to chunk at higher levels and, do, and, and, and convey faster concepts to each other, which means you need less time to actually communicate. You make a lot of people the founder. We heard yesterday advice that maybe there should be like one founder and if you bring on a second or third founder, it's kind of later and smaller equity. You take a different tact, which is a classic, it depends type answer. Why do you make so many people the founder of the company? It's interesting because being a founder or not is actually kind of like a random point in time. And you know, you all are founders, you may have people that are co-founders that may, had they come with you a year later or two years later, they wouldn't technically be founders. Sort of being a founder or not is clearly, there's one that, there's the founder that makes the, like the whole thing happen or a couple people that make it happen, but then there might be some other people that are around you at that exact point in time. And if there are other people that are around you at that exact point in time, this gets to my next sort of cheat code or hack, which is to make them a founder and give them founder's equity. This is a little bit of an unconventional stance. At Rome, we have, I believe, 18 people that are technically founders in the cap table. The wealth creation opportunity for someone who is a founder versus not a founder is stark. And I actually don't, you have to use them, but I don't really love stock options as a compensation tool because I think they're, first off, nobody knows how to value them properly. Everybody values them differently. So you could offer the same stock options package as somebody, another person, and they, they literally have no idea how to, uh, how, to, how to value it. The tax treatment is absolutely terrible. You get short-term tax treatment on, on stock options. Uh, so that, and, and that has no bearing on like what the sort of person here contributed or not. So. By making someone a co-founder uh, or a founder out of the gate and giving them founder's equity, one of the main things that they actually get right away is QSBX tax treatment, which means that their first $10 million are tax-free from the, from the feds if you're not in California. Uh, and so this is just like a, a windfall. Uh, and if you have an outsized success for your company, it actually means, and if, if you ever get shit about this from like a VC or something where they're like, why would you make all these people founders, blah, 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 you're giving up too much stock. If they get better tax treatment from the QSBS thing and can save up to 10 million tax free, you can give less shares. That will be worth more money <laughs> and create this win-win where the person gets long-term treatment, QSBS, and you don't have to give out as many shares to give them the same amount of value that they otherwise would have had. So it just seems like a pretty no brainer kind of thing to do. And you can still have the stock vest and, and, and take it away if, the, if you fire them or they leave. They, you know, the vesting can happen in a traditional way in the same way that stock options vest. Just the tax treatment is so much better. But then there's also the matter of pride. And if you let someone go around, let someone. If someone can go around, and say that they're a founder of something, uh, it really changes their conviction level, it changes their contribution level, and they're in the trenches with you and, and along with you for the ride. So I recommend, if you can, bring people along for that ride, as many people that are gonna be along for that ride and make them a fucking founder. You host a lot of events, um, but you have this idea of hosting customer dinners for VIPs. This is another trick. I was actually talking to a founder, so about three weeks ago I went to Saster. You guys know Saster, the Jason Lemkin's conference. Not as good as this, obviously. Um, and it's really focused on- I, pay, I paid him to say that. Yeah. <laughs> With free stage time. It's, uh, it's for SaaS, you know, SaaS, SaaS focused companies and there's, it's kind of got like the Dreamforce type thing. It's like the anti-Salesforce, anti-Dreamforce kind of conference in San Francisco. And we had a dinner, we hosted a dinner on uh, Wednesday, you know, one of the Wednesday nights there. Uh, and there was another founder who I invited to the dinner and she's the founder of a, of a great startup here in New York and they're doing awesome. They're B series, probably 15 million of ARR, maybe a little less, but growing pretty nicely. And she's like, I'm sorry, I can't come. We're hosting our own dinner. And we, 
and I talked to her the next day and I was like, well, how'd your dinner go? She's like, actually, like we had a lot of trouble getting people to come. There was like people didn't show. And how, she's like, well, how did your dinner go? Well, here's what we did. Do you guys know Scott Belsky, who's the head of Adobe Creative Cloud? So I saw he was a speaker at the conference. So I, reached, I like pinged Scott. I was like, Scott, can I host a VIP dinner in your honor <laughs> at Nobu? And he was like, well, I guess I'm going to be in town. I knew he was from New York. And he, so he's like, what's he going to do that? Of course. So he's not going to have anything to do. So I was, so Scott's like, sure. So then I just started emailing founders like, Hey, I'm hosting a VIP dinner for Scott Belsky. You want to come and meet Scott Belsky? So I just hijacked his name and got 32 people to show up to Nobu that all came and we had a really high response rate. So you should do that. That's a really good trick as opposed to, Hey, come to my, you know, startups dinner. It's going to be really cool. And I'm going to you know, promote my product and sell my product. And by the way, he was absolutely brilliant. The, the kinds of tips and techniques and things he said were, uh, that, that people wanted to, you know, with, with the future of, you know, Figma and all the Adobe strategy around all that kind of stuff. I mean, he's the one that spearheaded that acquisition. So people that use, I mean, how many of you use Figma in the last couple of days, like looked at a design model? Everybody. So people were asking about that. Obviously the, there's, there's antitrust issues there, but just being able to kind of hear from a founder, a unicorn person that then had gone on to start a big, you know, to run a big company and is a number two or three executive at one of the world's largest software companies is a compelling kind of thing versus, hey, come to my startup dinner. It's going to be awesome. When you went to raise money for Rome, I think you texted me and said that you were starting another company yeah. uh, and you wanted me to come see the product. And so I said, I'm in. When do you want me to come see the product? And you let me put a couple of little pennies into Rome. But I was surprised at how low the valuation was when you sent the docs because no matter what valuation you would have picked, I and many others would have invested. Why do you think keeping the valuation low is so important? How many of you are concerned about dilution? I, I really think that it is incorrect. I think pretty much you're going to, I'm sorry, like you're going to have a binary outcome. Like the thing that you can actually do is fuck yourself if you raise a too high of a valuation because it limits your optionality. Pretty much acquisitions in M&A really only happen at a few levels. There's kind of sub $100 million. Then there's like 250 to 300. Then you get to like the 800 range and then there's the billion dollar plus in which case you've already won and it doesn't really matter if you own 8% or 12% when you sell your company for like $2.6 billion, you're going to make kind of a lot of money and you don't, you don't really care about it at that point. And the thing though is that a lot of people that could get rich at that sub $100 million or even $300 million level raise money at that valuation thinking that it makes them feel good that their company is worth that. But let me tell you something about when you raise money. Your company is not worth that number. That just means that one person has decided that there's like a one in 10 chance that your company is going to be worth like a lot more than that number. It doesn't mean that your stock is worth that amount. It means that there's a probability that your stock is going to be worth a higher number than that amount. And so the VC, the venture capitalist is clearly playing that game. It's their advantage to have, you know, as many different bets as possible. And when you run all those different bets together, they end up with outcomes that ideally are in excess of what they've invested. But in the case of you, you have a binary outcome. It's either going to be zero or one. And if you raise money at too high valuations, you preclude yourself sometimes from lower outcomes, which could end up being highly advantageous to you personally, but not so much your VC. So my recommendation in general is to not, and I'm not trying, like I didn't do this because I, now there's another side of this too. I'm not trying to sell, Rome raised at 90 million, 95 million. We're not trying to, to sell. I wouldn't sell for many multiples of that right now. That's not our objective. There's another reason too that you want to maybe keep things a little bit lower uh, than you otherwise would. Number one is when you issue stock options, which is an instrument, which I hate clearly that happens at a forward on a value. But uh, I still hate that instrument. It's a necessary evil. You want to keep that as low as possible because you want your employees that are, that are with you to be incentivized to be along for the ride and have as much skin in the game as possible, number one. Number two, I just think it's better. And you saw this happen with Instacart. They priced their IPO a little bit lower. And everyone's like, oh, Bill Gurley, they left money on the table. And boy, if I had his Texas accent, by the way. Uh, <laughs> uh, but the point is that 
you know, you, you sort of can price it a little lower, which yes, technically costs you money, but it gets you people that are there for the long run. So, you know, Pomp, I, by, by pushing, by, by not maximizing valuation the first time, I now have you more aligned with me for the long run because we're, there's nothing that, that gets someone on your team than being in the money together. You have this idea of memorizing lines to make perfect copy, which is something that I don't think a lot of people think about. Why is that important? So John Lennon used to, when he would come up with a song, he would sing the song and he would then put the guitar or piano down and then come back to it the next day. And if he couldn't remember the song, he would think to himself, why should some kid in listening to the radio remember the song? If the, if the author of the song can't remember it, how will it be memorable to the, to the people listening later on? So he used that as a standard for whether or not a song was good enough. Now, none of you all have to write music or copy as good as John Lennon or an author or artist, but it turns out that the mere act of memorizing something is an editing function. And when you go out and you memorize your lines, your brain, the human brain actually kind of has a bug, which is a feature. The, the feature is the human brain won't remember stuff that's not good, which is awesome if you think about it, because it means that it only remembers stuff that's really good. So if you can exploit that feature, it means that you can do this. And so if, you, if you've got like a speech or you've got something you wanna say, I think going through the process of memorizing it will make it probably tighter. It will, especially if you do it verbally, like if you go back to ancient times, like it used to be that orators were like the, the ultimate way to, to, to communicate. Today we're all written, we're all reading. That's not how it used to be, in fact, uh, I could be wrong about this, but I believe that one of the ancient philosophers was sort of killed because he wasn't ready to orate at the level that he was expected to orate. You're, you're sort of smiling because you obviously know the story too. Point is, when you memorize your lines, you make it chunkier, you chunk it up into these sort of better concepts that people can uh, identify with. It's faster, it's better, and it ends up being, it's almost like a meme. So something you and I have talked a ton about is this idea of calendar zero and no one-on-one -on -one meetings. If someone starts a business, especially the first time, they have direct reports. How do I communicate with them? What is the pace that I should talk to them? Uh, should we set up meetings every week? Should they be every other week? Should they be three times a week? How long? You don't I, do any of that shit. Why not? I hate calendar. I hate I hate one-on-one -on -one meetings. I think one-on-one -on -one meetings. How many of you do one-on-one -on -one meetings? Everyone's going to tell you this is a very contrarian approach. So. You do one-on-one -on -one meetings because people tell you that this is a time for you to catch up with your employees and it's a time where they can kind of come to you with their concerns and blah, 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 blah. You know, I was reading, <laughs> I was reading about uh, Jensen Huang. He has 45 direct reports. He does no one-on-one -on -one meetings. This sounds like Steve Jobs. One-on-one uh, yeah, -on -one meetings. Steve Jobs had 30 direct reports. 30 direct reports, yeah. It, I mean, it, it's not just a way for him to be leveraged across more people. It's also just a way to cut out a bunch of, you got to collapse the stack. That's a whole other thing. But this, this point about um, no one-on-one -on -one meetings. So one-on-one -on -one meetings tend to clog up your calendar. So if you have 12 direct reports and you have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with each of them each week, that's like 12 hours. And if you work, you know, 72 hours a week or whatever, that's one sixth of your week, which has just gone away into literally one-on-one -on -one meetings, which is not productive and also burned up their time. There's another part about this too, which is like, it's not obvious to me that you should be having private conversations with people that the rest of the team can't see or hear. And so like, if you come up with a great idea and it's in a one-on-one -on -one or something, or you're working on something that other people are tangentially related to, I just think it could be better to have that conversation in a group setting. And so then you begin to think about, okay, well, what are the kinds of conversations that do need to be private and are private one-on-one -on -one conversations? And guess what? Those tend to be things that you shouldn't even be talking about in the first place or just a fucking waste of time because it's just people complaining. It's just people thinking about their own you know, career advancement, which, which is important, but doesn't need to be addressed every week in a one-on-one -on -one setting. And it, te it tends to turn into a therapy session, which, uh, uh, you know, you, you were probably not a licensed therapist and therefore shouldn't be doing this. Um, when you have so many direct reports, 
You're not delegating anything. And this is something spe specifically young founders, I think are told, build a team, trust your yeah. people, do all of this. If you go and you look at everyone from Mark Zuckerberg all the way on down today, these dudes are micromanaging. Yes. To a degree that would scare most people. Why? Every, as your company grows, the first thing that a VC is going to tell you is you need to figure out how to delegate. And then they're going to start to introduce you to some people. They're like, hey, you should meet Charlie. Charlie ran sales enablement at Salesforce. Or, you know, this person ran something at Oracle. And they really, you know, just have a conversation. They start to throw these weird sort of people at you. And you're like, what the fuck is this? Like, <laughs> what is sales enablement? What is, you know, all this stuff? And then these people come in and they show up and they have, they, they're awesome in like an interview situation. You start to talk to these people and, and they're, they're so good at talking about like all this stuff that sounds great. And then you're like, what the fuck did they just say? And it's, it's they, they, one of the, the, the things that you have to be like a buzzword, a keyword here, which is like, for me, a big red flag is when I hear the word playbook. Like, well, we come in and we run our playbook here. Their playbook is to actually hire a bunch of people to run a playbook that also then do the exact same thing recursively all the way down the chain. So, the, I, you know, what I would recommend is to delegate nothing to do as much as you possibly can, to identify what you specifically are awesome at, like your superpower. If that's product, then don't delegate product. If that's a particular part of engineering, don't do it. If it's business development and you're doing deals, don't delegate that. You can have some people that help you do those things in support of you, but don't just like try to replace yourself with someone that's going to do that so then you can focus on bigger picture items and scale and stuff. You may need to hire specialists in other areas, um, Finance is one in particular that as you grow and if you want to get big and run a public company, you'll have to hire a CFO specialist and they will have their playbook and it will be fucking expensive and they'll be hiring all kinds of people and auditors and all this kind of stuff that come in. That's all, that's all par for the course. But when it comes to the unique thing that makes your company special, look, Mark Zuckerberg still wakes up every day and I guarantee you the first thing he does is check the threads stats. I guarantee it. Like he's looking at how many threads were yesterday. That's, that's like what he lives for. And he doesn't need to be doing that still. Uh, and that's just what a founder ought to be doing. You just don't give up what is core. Keep it as close as possible. As someone that worked at Facebook, I guarantee he's looking at the stats every single morning. Um, Sunday night exec calls is something that you do. What are those calls? What are you guys talking about? Who's on them and why do you do them? So I love to just kind of get the team to everyone. How many of you work Sunday nights? Everybody, everyone's working Sunday nights. Uh, so everyone's working Sunday nights anyway. And you kind of around eight or 9 PM, you start to kind of come back after your weekend or whatever and answer the emails and start to catch up. Why not just get everyone together for an indefinite amount of time, which could go from one to four hours uh, beginning at 8 PM uh, and sort of just get through all that. That way the whole, the whole team is ready to go, you know, 9 a.m. Monday morning. So this is something I've been doing for 15, 17 years, just a Sunday night exact call. We don't turn the, there's no cameras. It's just, it's a call. It's just a, it's a way for everyone to kind of get a line for the week. I actually read Tim Cook does this. Uh, and if you, if you think about Apple, it makes complete sense because he's probably, you know, talking to Asia, which is already the next day for them by, by that point. And they're thinking about the supply chains and they just, it's a way to kind of stay a step ahead. So I, I think a Sunday night exec call almost saves your team a half day, a half day. Otherwise, if you do it Monday morning and it's a one to four hour call, then it's like nine to, you know, noon that next morning, you know, for, for a full morning for the, the company. And then it's like, okay, well, we just had the meeting. And so now like, you know, I'm in that sort of afternoon energy and I'm not ready to like crush the actual tasks. If you do it the night before, you can wake up that next morning. And, uh, you know, as, as someone said, today's going to be amazing. Let's crush it relentlessly. <laughs> um, something that you taught me is there's a difference between remote work and distributed work. Yeah. And my thought process of it is that there's in office, everyone knows what that is. What is the difference between remote work and distributed work? 
Well, I kind of think the whole remote work debate's kind of stupid. A hundred percent of successful companies have people everywhere. Doesn't matter if you're uh, uh, an agency, a, a t tech company, a doctor's, a hospital, you just got your people everywhere. And the, and the more big you get, the more places your people are just going to be. There's going to be specialists in Canada. You're going to have call centers in the Philippines. You're going to have engineering centers potentially in different areas across the country. You might have reps in the field. You have your sales reps everywhere. The founder and CEO, you're all here in New York right now. You, you know, where should you be? You should probably be with customers if you're not working on your product. And so, uh, a hundred percent of successful companies are distributed. The people are everywhere. And so for me, when I was running Yext, we had offices from Berlin to Beijing. And I always just wanted to kind of have in my pocket, the whole company in one headquarters from anywhere. And that's why I founded Rome, because I wanted to solve the problem of being able to have everyone in one office, even when they couldn't physically be together. Because when you're all here, when we're all in, under this one roof, and if we're all in desks and working and stuff, we, we have these quick, fast conversations. And, you know, as, as we've moved to this sort of Zoom calendar industrial complex, which I think Sam Lesson called it, uh, we've all now begun to block these 30 and 60 minute Zoom calls for internal stuff. And that is why uh, you know, I founded Rome to get out of having to have that so you can just get back to having these fast, short conversations everywhere. So distributed work is really, I think, the correct term. There are remote first companies. I actually think what matters more than where the company is physically located is the cadence by which the work happens, whether it's sync or async. I actually think that's the bigger question that a founder needs to decide much more than are we remote or hybrid or in the office room. What are the pros and cons of sync and async? Oh, I think async fucking sucks. <laughs> Uh, no, I, 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 look, there, there's async work. I, I think there's some people that try to run their company like a computer program. And there's a lost element of humanity when you try to do that. I think you can definitely do that when you have like a 35 person company. I think by the time you get to 100 people and then 150 is when you start to not know everyone's name, which is kind of weird for a founder. Like you right now, if you're a founder and you have 32 people at your company, like you are in total command of everything. You know every single detail and you can sort of run it like it's a big giant document and you can do it in Slack or Google Docs or whatever and you don't have to have synchronous work. I think, now, I think humans, by their very nature of being human, need to feel a connection, need to feel a human connection. And I think that's, part of the collective unconscious. It's part of life. It's a meaning of life to, to be with people and to win together and to, uh, by the way, that gets back to the co-founder comment. When you're a co-founder and you win together, it's like winning a battle together, which makes you feel closer to people, which is a, a cycle that repeats itself. And so when you're, when you're working on something hard and you're looking out and you're eating glass, jumping off the cliff into the darkness, when you know that other people are doing that with you, it just makes it a little easier. So there's something about working with people, being present, that uh, at the same time, that brings people, and I believe creates better business outcomes, not because like, we're all collaborating on the idea, but even if you're doing deep work, you need to know that there's other people around you doing deep work too. I don't know if we have uh, a video that uh, we're going to play. They'll play it if, uh, yeah, if we if have we it. Have, uh, but while we're waiting for that, sure. um, Rome is this really unique thing where uh, whether you have multiple offices or people are actually remote, um, you almost replicate the communication structure and uh, a lot of the different things that you would do inside the office. And I almost call it, like a lot of people call it a water cooler talk. I call it kind of bullshitting, but it's actually a really important function in a company. There's like a culture component to it, but there's also um, an exchange of information. Uh, there's ideas that come from that. Yeah. Bringing that into a virtual environment is really hard, right? Yeah. People don't just like randomly send each other Zoom links and like, yeah, Yo, you want to jump in here and just like shoot the shit. Right. And so talk a little bit as to like the product design and how yeah. you all think about yeah. shipping updates and, and really kind of listening to customers. Well, yeah. So, I mean, let me just quickly tell you a little bit about Rome and what we're doing. So first, 
Zoom was the first company to really solve the video conferencing technology problem. And if you remember video conferencing before Zoom, it was absolutely terrible. Oh, here we go. Cool. So, uh, well, here it is. <laughs> um, this is your virtual office. This is your whole company in one headquarters. You can see everyone gets a shared view of who's where. Hi, you can everyone. jump into different different kinds of rooms. Uh, obviously, we have all this stuff you'd expect, like whiteboards. And uh, but one of the cool things about Rome is there's different types of rooms. That's a theater in the middle. Uh, you can give all hands presentations in the theater. The audio only rooms, which are private offices, are the most popular room format. Believe it or not, 76% of meetings in Rome are audio only. The average meeting time in Rome is just eight minutes long. Can you repeat that? The average meeting time in Rome is just eight minutes long. Why, why is that? I think it's because, going back to the Zoom thing for a second, we've all moved to these 30 and 60 minute meetings. And so things that used to take two people five minutes in an office right now are being scheduled for 30 and 60 minute Zooms next week. But if I need to just chat with Pomp about something right now and I see he's in his office, I can pop over and have that quick, fast conversation with him and we're just done. And not only do I save him time because I didn't calendar him, but I also got the thing done faster because it was able to happen like now as opposed to waiting until I was able to like free him up and he could schedule something and whatever. So we're just back to kind of this fast synchronous work. And we, you know, we clearly made this thing for ourselves and we've been using it, but the velocity at which we are shipping is extraordinary. Uh, you know, now if you look just in the past couple of quarters, we can really compete with Slack on chat. We've got integrations. We can, we got something better than Fireflies and Otter so we can compete on summarization in our, in our group chat with our feature called Magic Minutes, which transcribes and summarizes and then creates a group chat with everyone in it about our, our, uh, about the call. We have a catch me up feature. If you're late to a meeting, bam, you'll get a summary right there with like what, like what you missed, um, that nobody else sees. And then you can prompt it. You can say, was it was pomp mentioned you know <laughs> like i did you know in what oh, context was not. anthony said <laughs> yeah like. so, so but, but one of the pieces i think as i've kind of seen people start to use this product and, and folks have you know shared feedback is that we talk a lot about like shipping culture right yeah. and, and shipping a lot of iteration of software very very quickly what you all seem to be doing is getting information to go faster inside of an organization what is the importance of that because you're unique in that you're building a startup, right? right? And I don't know how many people Rome has today, but it's a lot less than Yext had. <laughs> but you went through the full life cycle. You've seen running the public company, right, from start to finish. Um, and it almost feels like a lot of the decisions you're making today are specifically focused on not, I'm trying to run a 10-person company today. Right. It's, I'm trying to set the foundation to run a public company that's worth billions of dollars and has you know thousands of I'm employees. trying to give every one of you the foundation to run a billion dollar <laughs> public company. And, and so just, just like why is the information speed so fast and, and such a big focus? You know, when you look at our Rome map, when you're in an office, you get extraordinary signal about what's going on. So if you walk into a physical office, you can see who's there. You can see who's talking to who. You get a sense of people's moods. You can tell kind of the energy level right away. That is all gone when you're on a Zoom that's isolated in a silo. It's all gone when you're on Slack and everyone's just chatting all day. But when you look at the Rome map, you can immediately get sort of a marauder's map for the office. Uh, and you get a feeling for who's there, who's talking to who. You can knock on people's door. It gives you this kind of extra signal that you just don't get uh, in a... In a sort of Zoom type, Zoom first, Microsoft Teams first world. Um, and, you know, we also talk to our customers all day long. So that's the other thing. Like in, in Rome, you know, we go over, we chat with them, we'll pop over, we'll say hi. Uh, and, you know, and Pomp, we didn't talk about this, but I will say we're in closed beta right now and we're going slow. Uh, I wasn't going to break everyone's heart that they can't sign up at the moment. <laughs> you can join the wait list. We have a thousand <laughs> companies in the wait list and we're going slow. We have now 263 paying customers. We're getting close to about a million dollars of ARR, but that's not our goal. And I do have some advice for all of you in this, which is don't let your VCs dictate a growth rate. Now, you might kick me for this because you are probably an investor in all the companies here and um, you do want to be able to say, hey, you need to grow X. But I just think it's sort of arbitrary. It's like managing the economy centrally to set the, you know, to let a VC set the inflation number or something like that. Like, Wh whoops. Whoops. <laughs> the Fed seems to not be working. Yeah. It's like the Fed, the VC is like the Fed basically setting what growth should be, a growth target. And like, 
when you work backwards to achieve a growth rate, say, you know, X percent based on where you are, all you're trying to solve for is this like number that the VC said that you have to grow at that speed in order to X and you will end up doing things that are unnatural that may not be in the medium and long term interest of your business. Um, examples of that are over hiring salespeople or SDRs and pushing companies too hard to try you too soon before they're ready. And uh, and spending a lot of money on acquisition that's otherwise not worth it. So I, I would just pretty much push back on any any sort of sort of working backwards from a growth rate. You can only kind of do things naturally. It doesn't mean you don't make smart investments and bets. It just means that building a company is a little bit like building a garden, and you just kind of have to do it piece by piece over time. And it takes a long time. And you should build something that you want to own forever. And if it doesn't feel right when you hire an SDR, it's just going to spam the world about your brand and potentially undermine you in the medium and long run just to hit a growth target so that you can raise the next round. You're just playing a different game than building a long-term lasting company. The last thing I want to talk about is fundraising itself. Um, you're a successful founder, whether you like it or not. And so you have an advantage in some meetings in others you may not. And you've had a lot of experience meeting with investors who gave you money, a lot of investors who told you to kick rocks and get out of their office, some who have laughed at you and some who love you because you made them a lot of money in the IPO. When you went to fundraise for Rome, what was the strategy and why? Well, that was, that was easy because when you've, uh, yeah, come on guys, it's easy. That was easy. Well, and, and I'm just being frank with you. Like that was easy because when you've made someone a lot of money before they typically will, will, will back you again. So I don't, unless you've done that with someone, it's hard to kind of take that as like your strategy. Like I pretty much just called the person that I wanted to do the deal with. I said, this is the deal. And then then, and this is something you can do, and I do recommend doing, and everyone is doing this, so it's not particularly a novel idea, but we do have 55 incredible uh, founders in the cap table. So use your cap table as a weapon, I think is maybe the advice there, which is you ought to be thinking about who you can bring along this journey because, um, it, you know, and I use the 55 people in the cap table that are great founders and CEOs and well-known investors. I like kind of treat them like they work for Rome, <laughs> you know, and I give them assignments. I say, you do this, you do this, you do this. You, hey, can you give me an intro here? And I think that you, you will find a lot of people that are willing to do this. And, um, you know, there's, there's another thing you can do too, which is make people advisors. But if they're willing to, if they're successful enough, you can get them to be an investor. So I, I recommend, I recommend trying to build your cap table with call it three dozen people that are, that are awesome. And you can do it later on too. If you've started and you haven't done that yet, you can certainly in the next round add a dozen people to it. On this vein, um, raising a round, uh, especially when you've been a successful founder, you close the round. The second that word gets out that you close the round, a lot more people are interested. Yeah. Some people will open an uncapped note. Some people will say, thanks so much for your interest. I'll get back to you at the next round. Some people will ignore everyone. Um, what is the strategy that you've seen kind of work best? I, I think it really just depends on your company and what your needs are. I don't think there's a single playbook answer here. Uh, if you need to have more capital, you can certainly take it in. If there's somebody you freaking love, let them in an uncapped note. If uh, And if if you're set, I, you just shouldn't spend a lot of time fundraising. Most of your, I, I really do think people raise too much money. They focus on, you know, on what VCs think as the ultimate end. And that is really not what you're trying to do because the most successful companies are not too concerned about VCs and investors. They, it's an important, but not end all be all part of the game raise money from your customers and everything will take care of itself. The most important metric in your company by far, nothing else matters except net retention. If you have very high net retention, that means you have customers that love you. And you know what follows net retention is organic growth. Because when people love you, guess what they do? They tell their friends. And if you create word of mouth and you have people coming to you that have heard of you from a very happy customer, not only are you going to grow through the net retention of the existing logos because people love you, they're going to tell other people and that's going to make your acquisition costs go down. And if your acquisition cost goes down, guess what? You can charge lower prices. And guess what? When you charge lower prices, it makes people love you more because you're delivering a higher ROI to them. So this whole thing is like a cycle where if you have high net retention, you get lots of referrals, which in turn lowers your acquisition costs, which you can then pass on to those customers that helped you in the first place in the form of lower prices, win, 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 win. Totally do that. 
Don't worry about trying to grow at a billion percent just to, you know, just to make VCs happy. Don't raise your prices to grow. Keep people happy. Focus on net retention. Where can people go to sign up for the wait list? <laughs> uh, where do they go to sign up? You can, if you want to check out Rome. So, okay, the wait list is a little he bit. He feels like, so much pain. He wants everyone to use it. And, no, it's and they like, have this wait list and it eats them alive. And I love watching them suffer up here. <laughs> the wait list is a little fake. There's, there is a wait list. There is a wait list. But I'm going to just let you in on a secret. When you sign up for the wait list, actually what you're doing is you're booking a tour. And you're booking a group tour. And this is the cool part about it. This is one little hack that I don't really know why I'm saying this out loud, but I will. We, we found that when we did one-on-one -on -one tours, they're cool. But then we basically started getting too many people coming to us and we didn't have enough people to do the tours. So we started doing these group tours. So when you go on a tour, it's a little bit like going on a college campus tour of Rome where it'll be with a bunch of other people who you don't know. And it really just makes it fun. So that's what the wait list is. You still are in line, but actually you, you join the wait list by going on a group tour. So I would encourage you all to check it out and go on one of our fun group tours. It's like going to Disney World, except you can go through the express lane and, and experience the office of tomorrow. What's the URL? R-O And we'll play a little scavenger hunt game. There's a gentleman named John who I'm not gonna point out, so you all have to find him. <laughs> He told me beforehand that he will skip everyone to the front of the line if you can find them, which Howard doesn't like, but whatever. Um, all right. Thank you so much. Thanks, I appreciate Paul. it. <laughs> Kick ass.